So I want to talk about the NAR settlement. This is why having a brand is so important because you have to understand your ideal clients and what challenges and concerns they're coming to you with so that you know not only how to help them navigate that, but also how to market that. A really great agent might make their clients feel a little bit like, wow, that was the easiest transaction ever. Even while you're in the background, <sighs> panting, trying to catch your breath, right? <laughs> it's interesting to me when I speak to real estate agents who've been in the business for long enough to where they should be closing 20, 25, 30 deals a year just on referral and repeat business. And they're not because they don't treat their clients as a client for life. The agents who are going to cruise through these changes are, if you have found your way here, you are a real estate pro who's ready to transition from chasing leads to getting dream clients to chase you. This podcast is where you will learn the business and system strategies you need to grow your real estate business so that you can get paid consistently, connect with dream clients, and keep your sanity. So I want to talk about the NAR settlement and in, not in the way that you might think I'm about to talk about it, but I, I do think that we need to have a couple of different perspectives and I'm certainly not trying to add more to the noise because everyone and their mother has had something to say about the NAR settlement that has been proposed. I'm not even going to do you the injustice of trying to explain it to you because you've probably heard it explained ad nauseum at this point. And if not, you might want to call your broker. There might be something you need to be getting in the loop on. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how the changes, the proposed changes, so to speak, as of now, um, from the NAR uh, settlement with the DOJ are going to change real estate, but specifically how these changes are going to impact your real estate brand. Now, I want you to just kind of like go outside and touch some grass if you've been totally freaking out about this, okay? If you are watching this channel, if you are taking time to learn new skills in your real estate business, if you are really conscientious about the way that you are navigating your client journey and, and, and really showing up for your clients, you're gonna be okay, <laughs> all right? You're, you're gonna be okay. There are going to be skills that we are going to have to learn. There are going to be ways that we are going to have to pivot our real estate brands. But this can be, while it's annoying and not at all helpful for the public in my um, un, in my opinion, I, I do think that there are ways that we can look at what's happening and rise above it, right? We can pivot, we can take this as an opportunity to improve our business and become the best that we can be. Now, I'm not trying to be like rah, rah, toxic positivity about that. I'm genuinely saying when it comes to your real estate brand, that is one of the most important tools that we have to articulate value. So I want to start by talking about the real estate brand and what it is, especially in 2024. If you follow this channel for a while, you've heard me talk about branding many times. I'll give you a quick recap so that we're all on the same page. When it comes to your real estate brand, it is not the logos that matter. It's not the website. It's not the visuals. It's not like the aesthetics of your brand, the visual stuff. Your brand, the part that really matters is how you are articulating your value to your ideal clients. I'm going to say that again. Your brand is how you are articulating your value to your ideal clients. Now, what's so interesting is the number one thing that is going to change with the NAR settlement is how we do that. Now, you know that most, that, that most importantly with this NAR settlement is going to change the way that we are getting um, our buyer compensation or our buyer commitment agreement in place with buyers. A lot of you are probably very buyer heavy. And so I recognize why that would be a stressful thing and feel like you're going to have to but heads with your clients just to do the same thing you were always doing for them. I understand that feels really inconvenient, but here's the thing. The reason this is happening is because real estate agents historically have done an absolutely terrible job of articulating their value to their clients. The reason it is in question of what we are worth is because we don't take the time to explain what we are doing for our clients. 
and putting that in writing, okay? If you are not welcoming every single new lead and prospect with a services guide, a welcome guide, an explanation of who you are, who you serve, what makes you so great at doing that? A, 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 some kind of a piece of collateral that really fine tune explains every single thing that you bring to the transaction, then you're missing a giant opportunity to show your clients what you bring to the table. And so of course they're wondering why it is we're getting paid for what seems to be such a simple service. Because you know and I know that if we are doing our job really well, our clients never see that. They never see the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. Our job is to remove friction and stress from their home ownership journey. And in doing so, we hide a lot of the hard work that happens behind the scenes. That is the marker of a really great agent. A really great agent might make their clients feel a little bit like, wow, that was the easiest transaction ever, even while you're in the background <sighs> panting, trying to catch your breath, right? <laughs> and so what we wanna figure out to do in your real estate brand, and this has always been the point, and this is the same thing that I've been shouting from the rooftops for the last four years on this YouTube channel, is we have to get to the point to where we can clearly articulate what we do in a way that articulates our value without causing them more stress on the transaction side, all right? Or without opening more questions that make them feel scared unnecessarily, right? That, that make them perceive risk when there's really not risk, okay? And so let's walk through a few ways how we can be doing that in 2024 with our real estate brand. There's, there's a few components of the brand that I'm looking at completely revamping this year in our real estate business. This should not be a surprise if you've been listening to my content for a while or at least the last couple of months because I myself and my husband Bryce, we're a husband and wife team, have been sharing a little bit of the behind the scenes of how we've been improving our systems and client experience and just refining our brand. Because the beautiful part of a real estate brand is it allows you to pivot it is designed to evolve as the market evolves and as your ideal client's needs evolve. Okay, let's talk first about the intangible aspects of your real estate brand, being your story, your ideal client, and the transformation that you offer. Now, when you join the Market Authority Academy, one of the first things that we do is I walk you through a process that we call the brand builder. And I help you go through a series of exercises that are pretty simple, but very impactful, that help you learn how to articulate exactly what you do differently than others, like how you can stand out from the competition, even in a crowded market. This looks like the skills that you bring to the table, especially transferable skills if you're coming from a different industry. This also walks through how your experience matters. And so if you've ever heard one of those agents who say, well, I've been in the business for 20 years and this is the way that we do it, your clients don't care. Their, their clients don't care. Nobody cares because the way we do business now is so very different. So how do we make that 20 years of experience worth something? Well, you have to articulate why it matters. So I teach you how to do that. We walk through all the different things that you bring to the table that are surrounding your skills, your values, and your experience. Then with that first piece in mind, keep that in your mind, we then look at your ideal clients we have to identify who it is we are best suited to serve. There are some clientele that I just will not do a great job for because it's outside of my scope. Some of this is transaction related, like commercial real estate. I have no business trying to even dip my toes into commercial real estate because right now I know nothing about it. Could I learn? Certainly, absolutely. It's just not one of my plans. And so why would I ever even try to take on a commercial client when I don't even know the first thing that comes into a transaction like that? Other examples might be area, right? I'm licensed in the state of Arizona. Does that mean that I'd be looking to help serve a client who's looking two or three hours away? Certainly not. It's not even the same MLS. Why would I do that? It's outside of my scope. And so we have to get clear on who our ideal clients are. What kinds of transactions are they transacting? Or rather, where are they looking to buy or sell? 
And how can we help really clearly identify what their core needs and challenges are at that point, right? Think about that for a minute. When I got into real estate, our ideal client at first was first-time homebuyers because those were our network at the time. We were working with a lot of first-time homebuyers because we knew a lot of first-time homebuyers. And that time in 2014, 2015, that was one of the largest market segments in my area in Phoenix, Arizona. There was a lot of very affordable real estate and those were the homes that were selling the most. And so it made sense to lean into that. Those challenges of those first time home buyers were very specific to their position in the home ownership journey. And if you think about the recent home, first time home buyers you've worked with in the past, you know the, the questions that they have or the challenges that they have. And so over time and really getting acquainted to those challenges and understanding what can kind of hang them up, we got really good at helping them navigate that experience with ease so that at the end of it, they really saw the value that they brought to the table. And they were so grateful to have knowledgeable, experienced realtors who understood and were compassionate to their position in a way that helped them get to where they wanted to be. Now, today, my ideal clients are a little bit different. If you could imagine, my ideal clients today are a lot of those first-time home buyers that I helped get into homes years ago who are now first-time home sellers. They're selling their starter home maybe or their second home and moving up. They're upgrading in a big way. They're very excited about their vision. They're looking forward to that like quote unquote big boy house, right? And they're ready to really have a little bit more space they're experienced professionals themselves at this point. They've got some money saved up and they've got the equity of their home sales to move into a really nice home. Now, as you can imagine, their challenges are now different. You see where I'm going with this? The challenges and the questions and concerns that they come to me with are different from what I was helping people through eight, 10 years ago. And so this is why having a brand is so important because you have to understand your ideal client and what challenges and concerns they're coming to you with so that you know not only how to help them navigate that, but also how to market that. Because when you know these two things, you're able to create a transformation story that becomes the basis of all of your lead follow-up and all of your marketing. So that transformation story, which is the combination of you and what you bring to the table and your ideal clients and what they need and what they expect, what you're able to do is say, this is who I am. I am a real estate agent who specializes in second time move up buyers who are excited to move on to that next phase of their home ownership. I understand that you have a lot of questions around why would you, for example, sell a home at a low interest rate just to get into a home at a double rate at a higher price? How do you reconcile such a big move? I'm here to help you navigate that transaction in a way that puts you in your dream home and sets you up for financial responsibility in the future, right? That's what a transformation story sounds like when your brand is really dialed in. And I'm just doing that on the fly. It's just kind of an example. But think of how different that sounds as opposed to, I'm an experienced realtor in Arizona. Do you want to go look at houses? <laughs> Which is what a lot of real estate agents end up doing just, just as default when these pieces are not in place. And so imagine two realtors who have the exact same time of experience in the industry, who both care about their roles as realtors very much. One is able to articulate that brand in the first example and the other is not. Who is that ideal client going to sign a buyer employment agreement with? They're going to sign an agreement with the one who can clearly articulate why they're worth getting paid every single day. And now you might have clients who have worked with you in the past, who understand how amazing you are, and who don't necessarily need that articulation. But that doesn't mean that they don't deserve it. Because if you take pride in your work, you are going to find a way to help make sure everybody feels absolutely certain that they have the right people in their corner. And that is going to be the biggest change that the NAR settlement is going to have to the real estate industry. 
And so there's a couple of different areas where I'm looking to really beef up my processes to make sure that this is airtight. And the first thing that I want to kind of touch on are our client workflows. I'm going to talk about client workflows and I'm going to talk about the client experience. And then if we need to have a part two to this podcast episode, you need to let me know in the comments so that I can do that. When we're talking about client workflows, a client workflow is a sequence of events that happens at different stages of the client's journey. There are three main client workflows that I am looking at right now in my real estate business. And the first one is the new lead to client phase. This is the new lead to client phase or client workflow. We might also call this our client onboarding experience, right? And so what this looks like is when we get a new lead, what are the sequence of steps that we take that lead through to get them from brand new lead to committed client? How are we treating them how are we helping them know that they're in the right place? How are we making them feel amazing and secure and solid in their decision, right? How are we putting together an amazing action plan that clearly defines their next steps so they have absolute clarity in what the path looks like for their success? That is the level of detail that we need to be thinking about. Now I have a video coming out probably in the next couple of weeks where I might go more into detail about that. So please do let me know if that's something that you wanna hear about specifically the client onboarding sequence. But the next workflow that I want you to be thinking about is what happens after that. So once you get the client and you start writing offers, hopefully that offer gets accepted or hopefully that listing that you took on gets an offer that you've accepted. What are you doing during the transaction to make it feel super seamless? Are you providing a certain level of communication that you promised them? What does that look like? It's not on the fly communication. It's not shooting off a random text here or there. It's conscientious, intentional communication. What does your gifting process look like? Are you giving them amazing closing gifts at the end, whether they're a buyer or a seller? Are you helping to connect them with vetted professionals like handymen or inspectors or even lenders? painters, anything they might need during the process. One thing that we know of with our ideal clients is that the area where they tend to look at a lot of times has a lot of trouble with, and this is like such realtor speak, um, but they have a lot of trouble in this, in the areas where my ideal clients tend to look and want to live. Um, there are challenges with the sewer lines with the homes because the homes and the neighborhoods are much older. That's part of the appeal. There's that beautiful baked in post-war character that everyone wants to be around. Part of that are some older mechanics and systems. And so through our experience, what we determined is that, you know what, a lot of times once our buyers are getting to that inspection report, they're finding that something needs to happen to the sewer line. And so we went out and took the time to vet the best sewer professionals. I know it's so funny to say, like, why are we talking about sewers? But you get it. This is like such a realtor thing. We, vote, we vetted the best professionals to help connect them. And we were already prepared with that in mind for our clients before they even started the inspection, just in case. We're having conversations with them, preparing for them for this potential outcome during their inspection and walking them through their options, right? This is a level of area competency that comes with understanding your ideal clients and providing services that back that up. And so what are you doing during the transaction? And that's just a random example. What are you doing during the transaction to make sure that you are providing extra special care, that you're like, carrying them around the transaction, like you're holding a gentle little chick in your hands. I promise you if you're watching this video, that probably makes a little more, a little more sense of an analogy than if we were just listening to that while you're driving around. So I apologize for that. But how are you making them feel as if they are well shepherded, well guided on this journey, right? So that's the client to close journey or your client to close system, however you want to call that. Now, the, the last system that we're really thinking about, the last sequence, is our client for life sequence. What happens after the close? I talk a lot about referral-based business. Referral-based business is the best kind of business. And it is so crazy to me when I talk to real estate agents 
And I'm not calling you out here if this is you. It's okay. A lot of agents find themselves in this position. But it's it's interesting to me when I speak to real estate agents who've been in the business for long enough to where they should be closing 20, 25, 30 deals a year just on referral and repeat business, and they're not because they don't treat their clients as a client for life. So for me, my work starts at the closing table. That's how we've always looked at it. When our clients close, that is when our work begins. Yes, we are showing up with a closing gift and making sure that we're getting the review from the clients, absolutely all those things. But what's happening a week later? What's happening a month later? What's happening throughout the next 12 months? How are you staying in touch with that ideal client who has just closed on a massive transaction for them and brand new investment, or maybe they sold? And how are you making sure to take care of them throughout that process of learning how to be a homeowner or of becoming a new homeowner in your area, whatever the situation might be? How are you taking care of them? Are you providing seasonal maintenance items that they can be looking at? Are you taking that inspection report during the transaction and maybe taking some time to come up with an action plan for them that they can follow with some suggested vendors to take care of just a few of the repair items that, you know, didn't seem too important to get done during the transaction, right? What are you doing to really show them that you're in their corner after the sale? That is a conversation that we have been having ad nauseum in the Market Authority Academy. And genuinely, when all of this stuff came out about the NAR settlement, there was a conversation about it in the Market Authority Academy, like just understanding the terms and understanding what to expect and understanding what questions we need to be taking to our brokers and our associations to make sure that we're prepared. But, but by and large, with some exceptions, there hasn't been a great level of fear or like, hair on fire running around the office. What are we going to do? The sky is falling, right? Because when you have a really solid client onboarding experience, when you have a really solid client to close experience, when you have a client for life experience and you run through that enough times and you see the return of that, you understand how to articulate value and you understand that your clients are picking that up and running with it. It's not scary to learn how to fight for your value or fight for your worth when it is a natural part of the process of what you do. And that is the number one way right there, how the NAR settlement is going to change real estate brands forever. And so from my perspective, I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, this is a really cool opportunity. I get to get really creative, which is something that I love to do. I get to be creative about my systems. Look at the brand experience that we we're providing. Look at that wow client experience and show up even better for my clients with courage and commitment and help them understand that we've got this. They've got this. We're all good over here. We don't have to worry. Yes, we are going to have to learn new skills. Yes, we are going to have to tweak our processes just a little bit. But that's what you do in business, my friends. When you become a business owner, which is what happens the moment you decide to become a real estate agent, you are making the decision that no one else is going to be responsible for getting you paid. No one else is going to be responsible for you getting leads. No one else is going to be responsible for you getting those referrals. No one else is going to be responsible for building your brand. That all falls on you because now you are a business owner. And what that also means is you are now susceptible to the changing tides of the market, of the industry, of the policy. And our job is to figure it out. Our job is to pivot. You know, I was speaking to a coffee shop owner recently. We had um, just a small local market authority meetup at a really cute coffee shop in my local area. And when we got there, they were packed. Now, this place built out this new coffee shop back in, I want to say like 2021 or 2022. So pretty new. They've only been open for a couple of years. 
And I don't remember them ever being as busy as they were. We were there for a good two hours, just chit-chatting and talking shop and just collaborating as we do in Market Authority. And there was not a moment where there wasn't at least a little bit of a line of people coming in, grabbing coffee. There were moms coming in with their kids as they were walking between play dates. Uh, there were students there studying on their laptops. There were other small business owners like entrepreneurs working in there. All, a range of different individuals, all just spending time in this community place. And so I spoke to the owner and I was saying, you know, how great it was to see how busy they were. And I said, you know, you've, you guys have been around for a while. I don't think I've ever seen it this busy, but I'm so happy to see that you're doing well because it's such a bummer when there are these brand new coffee shops that look beautiful. I, I mean, you can tell I get a lot of coffee, you guys. Um, and she was saying how, you know, we are doing really well right now. It's great to see because for the first two years of our opening, it was crickets. She went on to say, we almost didn't make it because it was so slow and we had really, we had a really hard time really getting traction and understanding how to get people to come. And what they did was they pivoted. So instead of folding and saying, oh, this just didn't work out or maybe blaming it on poor management or the economy or the pandemic, they had all of those valid excuses. But you know what they did? They went back to the drawing table and they said, who are we looking to attract and why are they going to want to spend time here? And so these owners decided to turn that coffee shop into a more Thai tea style coffee shop. And I didn't even recognize it until I looked at the menu. And sure enough, there's all these Thai teas and Thai coffees, which are absolutely amazing. If you have not had like a Vietnamese coffee before, it's like you, you got to go get it. But they also had boba teas. They had all kinds of really cool drinks on the menu that were just familiar enough to be easy to choose if it was your first time visiting there, but also just enough to set them apart and give someone a reason to go out of their way. So one of the members in Market Authority who was there, she got this yuzu peach tea. And when I tell you that that tea was like the most amazing looking refresh refreshing beverage I have ever seen, it is April, we are in Phoenix. It was 93 degrees on this day. And my agent is over there just sipping on her yuzu peach tea, having the best time visiting with others. Like it was an amazing experience. The inside of the coffee shop was beautifully decorated. There was plenty of different types of seating depending on what you needed while you were there. They had some light bites for lunch. So if you wanted to stay for a while and work, you could also make sure that you got yourself a sandwich or a panini if you needed it. And the staff was really nice. When I walked in, everyone knew who I was because I called them and told them to expect me. They knew me, they knew me by name. They made sure to accommodate my larger group and it was amazing, right? Two years ago, they were worried that they were gonna to have to close down their doors. And today they're a thriving business. Because they chose to pivot and lean in to a unique brand. And that is what we are going to have to do. And so I appreciate you listening this far if you have, because the agents who are going to cruise through these changes are the agents who are going to be willing to do the work and who are going to be willing to pivot and who are going to be creative and have fun with it and take risks, not risks with our clients, of course, but maybe put themselves out there and try something new, try something hard. We can absolutely do that. We didn't get into real estate because we were afraid of hard work. We got into real estate because we wanted our hard work to mean something. And that is our opportunity now with these changes coming down the line. And so that's my calling to you. What are you gonna do about it? What are you going to do about it? I want you to know that we are doing something about it and we have been for the last several weeks. And we are also helping support the agents in my coaching program, the Market Authority Academy, to make sure that they are prepared and they feel confident and comfortable in any situation that might arise from this. And so if you are looking at this as now is the time that you need that support, you need that handholding, you need the systems, you need those client workflows, you need the client experience, I've got that for you. It's already done. It's ready to be adapted to your business and personalized to your ideal client and market. It's called the Market Authority Academy. I can help you. All you have to do is book a call 
with me and my team. When you fill out that call application, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds. And then you're on our calendars. And the first thing that we do is we talk about your business, your challenges, your ideal clients, where you want to be. And if it seems like we can help you get there and help you overcome the challenges you have and achieve these really big goals that you have, then we talk about how we can do that. If we can't help you, we'll let you know and you can get off the call. But otherwise, if it seems like we can help you, we'll walk you through the action steps that we can present to you. And if it makes sense to work together in our coaching program, then we'll talk about next steps from there. So that's my call to you. Look at your business. Where can you improve? Where are you leaning into? What do we need to pivot for your brand? We've had a lot of different things we've covered today in this conversation, but I want you to now take action. So whether that's booking a call with me with the Market Authority Academy or pulling out a pen and paper and starting to jot down some ideas, that is what you need to do next. I am cheering you on always and in your corner. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this conversation on the Market Authority Show. Share it with someone else who needs it. We're all in this together and I'm here rooting you on every step of the way. Till next time, keep on crushing it.